Welcome to Syracuse.com's 2017 Syracuse mayoral debate. I'm Marie Morelli, editorial opinion leader for Syracuse.com and the Post Standard, and I'm here with my colleague Chris Baker, City Hall reporter. We're coming to you live from our downtown newsroom in a first for us, and we're glad you're along for the ride. We also are pleased to welcome the four candidates for Syracuse mayor, Laura Levine, Juanita Perez-Williams, Ben Walsh, and Howie Hawkins. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Our goal tonight is to engage them in a lively conversation about the challenges facing Syracuse and how each of these candidates would meet them. The candidates will have one minute to respond to the initial question and they'll be allowed rebuttals at our discretion. Stay tuned immediately afterward for continuing coverage on Syracuse.com and Facebook Live where we'll have coverage from the spin room and a panel of uh, analysts looking at what happened during the debate. To begin, we'll have the candidates introduce themselves briefly. Before we sat down, the candidates drew lots to see who would go first, and we'll start with Laura Levine. Marie, Chris, Syracuse uh, Media Group, thank you so much for having us tonight. We're really delighted to be here. My name's Laura Levine. I'm the Republican candidate for the Office of Mayor of Syracuse. I'm a lifelong Syracusan. My husband and I live in my childhood home. I lived in the same neighborhood for my entire life. As you know from a recent poll, the majority of people feel that Syracuse is on the wrong track. Syracuse has tremendous potential though. And with my 40 years in public education, 30 as a leader, I believe I can lead a turnaround for the city. Thank you again for having us. Juanita? Yes. Good evening. Thank you for doing this. Juanita Perez-Williams, I'm the Democratic candidate for the city of Syracuse mayor, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm a mother of four grown children, and I'm a grandmother. I live in the Strathmore neighborhood, which I'm very proud of and feel very invested in. I love my home, and I love the families in our neighborhood. I'm an attorney in the city. I've served uh, the United States Navy as a lieutenant commander, and I've also served as associate dean at Syracuse University. I am going to be the first mother of the city of Syracuse, and I'm going to look after our children and their future, and we need that more than anything in this city. Ben? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ben Walsh, and I'm the independent candidate for mayor. My wife Lindsay and I bought our home on the city's west side about 11 years ago, and we chose to raise our two daughters here. Our oldest daughter is enrolled in the city school district. We could not have more invested in the future of Syracuse. Now we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, uh, but I truly believe that our best days are yet to come. We need new leadership willing to rise above the partisan politics and move our community forward. I believe that I'm the only candidate that has a proven track record of doing just that. Thank you. Howie. I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for mayor of Syracuse. I live on the south side. I'm a Syracusan by choice since 1991. I was raised in San Francisco Bay Area, went to Dartmouth College, served in the Marine Corps, was a carpenter for 20 years before I became a teamster out at UPS unloading trucks. But I think the most relevant experience I brought is I've been an organizer in movements, progressive social movements since the 1960s, and I think the next mayor needs political skills to unite Syracuse behind progressive reforms and get the changes we need from the state to help Syracuse survive. All right, very good. Thank you all. Uh, we'll start tonight with police and safety, uh, a hot issue on a lot of people's minds. There are 420 police officers on the job in a city of about 144,000 people. That's a higher than average per capita number, according to a recent report. Do you think that number is enough? And if not, what's the number we need? Uh, Laura, we'll start with you. The number's not enough. We should be at around 465 officers. While a lot of our crime has decreased, our homicide rate was a record number high last year. We really need to take a much closer look at how we are deploying our officers, but when you don't have enough, you can't deploy them to where they need it. Syracuse has the highest concentration of poverty among blacks and Hispanics. We recently went from being the 29th to the 13th most impoverished city in the country. So does crime lead to poverty? Does poverty lead to crime? Whether or not there's a cause and effect, we know there's a correlation. We don't have enough officers to respond to the calls that come in. I hear from a lot of frustrated people who call. They wait six, eight hours with a burglary report. And we certainly don't have enough police to deter crime in the way of implementing true community policing, which is what we would be able to do if we had the right number of police officers employed. So 465 is 
what you think is the right number. 465 is the number I would aim for. I spent five hours in a police car from 1030 until 330 in the morning recently. Um, I saw the limited staffing that they had and how short, they're just stretched too thin for all the calls that came in. We're sending one officer in a unit and times at times when there should be two in a unit. It's not safe enough for our officers and it's not safe enough for our residents. We should be aiming for 465 officers. We spent thir $13 million last year on police over time. Approximately 25% of that was reimbursed. We should be looking at spending the unreimbursed money at hiring new officers. Some people have said overtime is cheaper because hiring new officers means you have to pay for benefits and pensions. We need a strong contract negotiator so that we can employ more officers and ensure everybody's safety. Very good. Right, let's get one in and ask a question. You know what, last Saturday I had an opportunity to go out with the police uh, because I wanted to get a first-hand experience of how they're handling the high volumes of crime that they keep talking about. And clearly we need more police on the street. Uh, because what I found is that every time the shot spotter went off and we had to drive to an incident where there could be victims, it took four or five police officers on, uh, off the street and we only had 30 on and this was last Saturday night. So at the end of the day, we need more police officers. But in addition to that, this city has not done a deployment assessment study on our first responders for over 20 years. We need to do that first. Because we don't only need to know how many officers are, uh, should be out there. We need to know where they need to be. We need to know how they should be deployed. Are our shifts set up to meet the type of crime that we have? Are our shifts set up to meet the type of crime we have in neighborhoods? So I'd like to do a deployment <coughs> study uh, when I become mayor. But at the end of the day, we need to find revenue to have sufficient police on our streets, not just to deal with the crime we have now, but to deter it from happening. Um, and from my understanding, meeting with Chief Fowler, uh, we should be at a number around 460, 470. Um, but we know back uh, in the early 90s, when we had over 500, cri crime didn't decrease. So okay, it's I'm about gonna, an gonna assessment. Yes. There. So you, same, same general, both, both of you are saying around 465. Yes. Um, let's get Ben in on uh, this question. We absolutely need more police officers on the streets. Uh, I, I, I checked in with uh, the police department today. I heard the number as of today I heard was 419. I think we need to get to around 470. Uh, you know, I was recently in touch with the young man that was shot when he was out canvassing, uh, Mr. Rufus. And uh, you know, he's, he's very shook up by what happened. And I think his experience is, is, is as good of an indicator as we can have that we need uh, more officers. Uh, his call came in as a level three. And when I did my ride along, and we've all done them uh, now, uh, when those level threes came in, uh, th those were not the priority. And, and whether it's a, a, a level three uh, like it was for Mr. Rufus or, or um, if your car gets broken into, um, everyone pays taxes, everyone deserves to have police services. And right now we don't have enough resources um, to, to provide the services that, that our taxpayers are paying for. In addition to new police, uh, it's, it's important that we employ new technology to give the police the resources that they need. Uh, and by having more police on the streets, they can develop relationships in the community uh, that will help them to be more proactive in addressing crime uh, and also be in a better position to solve the crimes when they are committed. All right. Very good. Howie? I don't know what the magic number is. I mean, obviously, if you have more officers, you have more flexibility. What I do know is we can't afford more officers at this time. We are on the brink of insolvency. We have 261 people in the city making over $100,000. One is the mayor, a few are firefighters, and all the rest are police officers. They're expensive. Uh, how we deploy our officers, I want to review that with the police chief when I'm mayor. I want to do community policing where every officer is assigned to a neighborhood, gets to know the neighbors and the businesses, and is proactive in solving problems and de-escalating conflicts. I also want to put youth workers out there to reach those unattached youth. The only crime going up is shootings by youth at each other. We're sixth highest in the nation of youth who have been injured or killed by shooting at each other. And we need to bring those people back into society with a job, education, maybe they need drug treatment, maybe they need just counseling because they've grown up with a lot of trauma. I think that's the first investment, the most effective investment we can make. And if we get, you know, increased revenues through progressive tax reforms I've been talking about, then we can hire more officers. But the number, I don't have a number for you. I want to go over with the next police chief. All right, so I'd like to turn your point. Um, uh, similar to something that uh, the mayor said yesterday and address it to the three of you. Um, the, the idea is that we don't have enough money to hire more cops. Now, we were spending $13 million on overtime, um, and there's been some back and forth over whether we can decrease that, and if decreasing that would give us the money for more cops. So where would you find the money? We're talking about 
um, at least the three of you, 45 more cops putting on the street, where do we find the money for that? Uh, uh, Juanita, we'll start with you. Well, I think we have to take a step back because if you look at the 2016-17 budget that the city put out, um, uh, we had the money. The money was there. Uh, it was budgeted, so it was utilized for other resources, and I think that's where the concern came that, that the funding was taken away. So originally, we, we had that funding. So when you, when you uh, start to look at where we can try and figure out where we find these resources, you know, quite frankly, I've been looking at uh, things such as the way we deploy our own uh, public servants, how we're deploying our DPW folks, how we're deploying our codes enforcement. I think there are ways that we can do that differently, uh, do them together in teams uh, so they are supporting police work, so they're supporting our first responders. I think that's where you save some revenue and you can turn some uh, money back over to law enforcement to ensure that we have enough on the street. Ben? We do have resources uh, in the budget that are, uh, that are not being used to hire more officers. That's where we need to start. Uh, on top of that, uh, we need to look at the overtime number and do the cost-benefit analysis and, it, as I believe, uh, uh, use those funds more more effectively to hire new officers rather than spending it on overtime. Uh, we also need to develop relationships with our partners at the state and federal level uh, to uh, to s seek out new uh, sources of, of revenue uh, to, to hire more officers. So there's no uh, there's no one solution. Uh, we need to uh, we need to go at it in a number of different ways. But ultimately, it comes down to priorities. And if people in our community don't feel safe, then everything else that we try to do, from economic development to neighborhood revitalization, is all for naught. So it's, it's a priority for me, and it will be uh, uh, for my administration. Uh, how, would you like to address this? I, mean, I think your answer is a little different than the others. Well, I, my answer is similar to what Mayor Miner said, is uh, you know, every department would like more staff, and you've got to prioritize. I, I would just add that for the cost of one officer, we can do three outreach workers to get these unattached youth connected. And I think that prevention plus anti-poverty investments is where we start to reduce the crime so the officers aren't running every which way to respond to sh shots fired. That should be, the, I think, the initial investment given our limited resources. All right. Laura. The number one priority for city government is public safety. I've been talking about the schools and crime consistently and emphatically throughout my campaign, but far and away, our number one responsibility is public safety. We need someone who knows how to negotiate contracts really well that are mutually beneficial. We had a time when our police officers worked six days on and two days off. Then it went to five days on and two days off. We're now at four days on and two days off. So that's a reduction of 33% in terms of their actual engagement on the job. And as I said earlier, we've got almost $10 million in overtime that was spent that isn't reimbursed to us. I was told today that every shift every day has overtime assigned to it. This is not a good use of our resources. Our police officers are going to be, I would imagine, just as a matter of human nature, overtired, uh, at times maybe less capable of using their best judgment. This is not the way to run a city. We have to find the money. This is of paramount importance. It's our responsibility to our residents. So where do you find the money? Do you have? From the, we start with that $10 million of overtime that wasn't reimbursed. And you use that in, in good, solid, contract negotiations. People are worried about the pensions and the benefits that have to be paid to new officers. Pension costs are coming down. There are ways of doing this, but you need to have someone with skill and experience at negotiating contracts, which I have, and that's the place to start. We definitely need more officers, and I would start with that over time. All right. Um, let's go to a different aspect of the policing. Uh, one of the most important hiring decisions you'll make is to hire a police chief. Um, what two or three qualities will you look for in the next chief? Uh, and I'd like you to be specific about, it's kind of an open-ended question, but I would like you to be specific, specific about what kind of uh, qualities you want in a police chief. And we'll start with Ben this time. Uh, compassion is the first word that comes to mind. We are dealing with a lot of uh, difficult challenges in our city, uh, many of which stem from the, the poverty that we have uh, in, in many of our neighborhoods. So our police chief has to have compassion and, and, has, to, uh, and has to instill that uh, throughout the department and empathy, uh, make sure that they uh, can understand and empathize with what uh, many of our citizens are going through. Most of the time they're dealing with our citizens, it's when our citizens are at their worst. Um, and that's when our, our officers need to be at their best. I also think it's really important for our, our police chief um, to, um, to make sure that he's uh, or she is uh, holding um, uh, the department accountable. Accountability is, is critical. If we want to build trust and relationships uh, uh, throughout the city, uh, we need to make sure that we're holding ourselves to the same standards that we're holding the rest of the community to. 
Howie? I would look for somebody like Chief Chris Magnus, who is the chief of police in Richmond, California, under a green mayor, and they committed to community policing and reaching out to the youth. They had a higher murder rate than we have. They had a higher crime rate. And in the course of the eight years, by doing the community policing and an intensive work with those unattached youth, they cut the homicide rate by 75% and the property crime rate by 40%. And then the other thing, which Chief Magnus was able to do, he's able to increase the number of people of color on that police force from 20% to 60% over those eight years. It's a city that's 80% people of color. We're half people of color, but our police force is only 10% people of color. And this is 37 years after the federal consent decree, which was supposed to increase uh, the hiring of black cops 10% in every rank. We still haven't met that criteria, and that's inexcusable. So I think that would be the second thing I want a police chief that really was able to do that and committed to it. How are you look outside the current department for a chief? Yeah, if Fowler's moving on as he says he will, um, yes, I would look outside because I think part of the reason we haven't diversified is the old boys network. There are also questions about abuse of overtime when they were, for example, doing background checks on overtime of Pop Warner volunteers. That just seemed like padding, padding their paychecks. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot of questions. Um, where's the civil office? Civil asset for civil forfeiture assets. I haven't seen them on the city books. I understand they're in deposits downtown. I mean, there are a lot of questions like that in terms of uh, is this police force really accountable to the city administration? All right. So I think we need an outsider. Okay, Laura. Uh, what I'd be looking for in our next chief is someone who strikes that balance between having a great rapport with the rank and file, but who also has the ability to be very objective about every person's performance, and who also has the ability to step back and kind of look at the big picture of how the whole department is functioning. So one of the people I've cited is the police chief of Camden, New Jersey, who with a lot of professional development and training really reestablished the culture of his department. And what's happened as a result is that they've learned how to de-escalate serious incidents to the point that, I mean, there's some great videos if you want to see it. That's the kind of thing that can happen here. So whether I would be looking for someone from within or from outside, I just want the best person for the job, someone who will be accountable and who will be able to establish that rapport of loyalty to the rank and file, but also have the ability to be objective, size things up, accept criticism, and look for criticism in the department himself or herself. Juanita. I've worn a uniform. Uh, I know how important it is to have a strong chain of command. Uh, and uh, I'd like to find someone who can inspire uh, the law enforcement that we have now. Uh, we have a lot of morale issues, uh, and we need to have someone that can come in and, and rebuild uh, our core uh, and to ensure that uh, when they're on the street or when they're working with each other, uh, they, they have a sense of respect for each other, respect for the community, and, and dignity. So we need a strong uh, police chief that understands that. I, I want a police chief that understands urban policing. Um, our, our city is, has a lot of issues, as we know, with poverty and, and violence, and we, we need someone who has the experience to come into this community and rebuild the trust, rebuild uh, a, a, an understanding of accountability, uh, and to get people to, to really feel like together we can solve crime. Uh, and most importantly, we, we have a lot of unsolved murders. Uh, we need a police chief that knows how to get to the, into the trenches and figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, we can't move forward unless we know what's happening uh, presently and what types of people are out there committing these crimes and, and determining you know, uh, who, who, uh, who was doing this. So uh, we need someone who needs to be really well-rounded in urban policing and has a passion for the people in the community. Let me follow up and ask you, does the mayor set the tone or the police chief set the tone for the police department? Well, you know, I think the mayor sets the tone. Uh, as again, as I said before, I, I've worn a uniform, and uh, this has to be a, a response of uh, how we, as a community, treat our people and treat our city employees. It goes from the top to the bottom, and I would expect a, a police chief to also set that same example. We all have to be speaking from the same page. We all have to be uh, promoting the same message of, of dignity in our communities and valuing all people. Um, I think a good mayor uh, stands side by side with her leadership and everyone is saying the same thing, but the tone starts with your mayor. Ben, would you like to get in on this question of, uh, you know, inside or outside? Well, I think we need the best person for the job. Uh, I, I do think that, um, you know, it's important that, that it's someone that, that understands uh, the issues of, of the city. 
Um, but again, I think ultimately it comes down to uh, the, the culture that, that they establish, and I do think that it, it, it starts with the mayor, and that's one of the things that I'm most excited about uh, as mayor is to, is to set the tone for the entire city administration, including the police department, to establish a culture of customer service, of accountability, to establish very clear metrics about uh, it, it, uh, by which every department can be held accountable. I earned my master's in public administration up at the Maxwell School, and that was that was really ingrained in me how important it is to make sure that we're measuring ourselves and we're holding ourselves accountable. So uh, that's uh, especially important in the police department. So would you? So you would look outside the department as well as inside? Absolutely. I, I want to look. I want to find the best person for the job. Okay. Should we move on? Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to our next topic, and we're going to talk about uh, everybody's favorite topic: money. <laughs> Uh, we all know that the, by most estimates, the city could be insolvent within two years. We know that state aid to municipalities has been flat for many years. Payments from Destiny USA dried up this year. Property taxes are only 10% of our revenue, our operating budget, excuse me. So we'll discuss both sides of the equation, but where is the first place you turn to increase revenue in the short term? And then I'll turn that around and, and ask about the long term. And we'll start with Howie this time. Well, I open my stump speech or when I knock on doors by saying I want to be the next mayor of Syracuse, not its last mayor. And if we don't solve this problem, we may get a state financial control board, which will decide our budget over our heads, may recommend that we dissolve into the county like the consensus uh, proposal recommended on terms not favorable to city residents. Uh, so I think the first place we go is revenue sharing, which you mentioned. This, City, the state now provides one half of one percent of state revenues. In the 1970s, it was eight percent. If they just doubled it to one percent, that'd be 70 more million dollars. That's number one. Number two, we should get home rule so we can tax ourselves the way we want to. And I'm calling for a progressive income tax on residents, commuters, and absentee landlords, anybody making money in the city. Under 25,000, you might pay zero percent. 25 to 50, maybe half a percent. Over 100,000, a percent and a half. So it would be graduated and progressive. And I think that's only fair because all the people that don't live in the city are using the water, the streets, the police. They should, you know, pay their fair share. That would make the tax base more broad. It would be sustainable and it would be fairer. And that's how we can uh, get out of this fiscal crisis and do the other things we want to do. And if we don't solve that problem, everything else we're saying is uh, maybe beside the point. Laura? There are two ways to balance a budget. It's what I've done as a school leader for 30 years, most recently as a school superintendent. There are two sides to it. You look for cost efficiencies and cost reductions. I'm confident that with an assessment of every department in the city of Syracuse, we will find cost efficiencies and cost reductions. At the same time, you have to generate revenue. And I believe that the way to do that is to make the city of Syracuse a more desirable place to live. Right now, with our schools being underperforming and unsafe, with our record homicide rate, People are not looking to buy houses in Syracuse. I've said before, when people are moving to central New York, they're not going to ask the realtor who has the best hotels downtown or who has the smoothest roads. They say who has the best schools in the safest neighborhoods. We only have a little more than half of our properties on the, taxes, on the tax rolls. We need to make des a desirable place where people will choose to live and work and send their children to school, put more houses on the tax rolls, that will generate more revenue while we are also looking to reduce um, costs in other departments. So you're, you're talking long term there though, desirability is not something that's going to happen in your first three months and, and people aren't going to move here all of a sudden in your first three months, short term. I mean, we've short got term, maybe two years and we've got a huge Then short term we have to look at jobs and one of the problems we have right now is that we have job crushing fees and bureaucratic red tape that are almost impossible for people to overcome. We have people who are in business in Syracuse right now who are finding it incredibly challenging to get their work done and to create more jobs. We have people who, uh, I know of one man who was operating a restaurant on one side of a street to move to the other side of the street. He, all he said was, I wanted to go from over there selling fish to this side of the street to sell falafel. It took him two years two years to get all the permits that he needed and because he operated on someone's oral permission instead of written permission he ended up with a bill saying he owed a hundred dollars per day in fees going back two years this is not the way to invite businesses and to create economic development and to create jobs we need to smooth this out the pre-approval permitting process that's been in place it's not working we need to make this a much more user-friendly place for people to start okay. and grow their businesses okay. thank you Juanita I've been in executive management for a number of years, and 
Um, no matter how you slice it, you, you have to get into office and figure out where government can be more efficient. I'm going to start there. I know I've, I've heard over and over again that we have uh, not left any stone unturned, but frankly, I want to get in and see how we're actually utilizing our resources and how perhaps we can create mechanisms where we're doing more things without uh, using all of our resources and maybe saving on some of our revenue. Uh, I, I also want to talk about relationships. They're very important here. Uh, I've been working for our governor for a number of years and I worked with him when I was an assistant attorney general. That relationship is key. We have not had a good one and I believe when we move forward and are talking about additional revenue for the city that we'll be able to find some opportunities there with regard to projects uh, and, and new development here in the city. Um, but you're right, you have to have short term and you have, long, have to have long term. Short term, uh, there have been ideas out there about perhaps a, a tax on a hotel, hotels for people who come to visit our city. That's something that we can consider. Other cities are doing it. We have a prime asphalt and paving system in our city that isn't being utilized. I'm being told by the DPW folks it's because we don't know how to utilize it. We could actually use that in our city and, and outsource that to towns and villages and what have you and for our own uses. So it's a, it's a way to do that. Okay. Uh, long term 81, uh, that's the game changer. So I would talk more about that. We'll get to long term. Right. Okay. Let, let me follow up though on uh, the governor. Uh, he was in this very building when he said, Syracuse, fix your own pipes. What, what, how is that going to change? Well, I think, you know, you have to have a partnership. He, he's absolutely right. And, and the state held its hand out to us to talk about how we could invest in the city and in our infrastructure and have a partnership with the state. We didn't do that. We didn't even pick up the phone and ask. We have to be able to have a relationship so we can benefit from that relationship. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think we, we need to get to a place where we're not sus uh, being sustained by leaning on government, but we have to start somewhere. And when we're talking about ways to focus on our infrastructure and our governor is saying to us, fix it, but at the same time saying, here's a resource to help you, we, we can't push the hand away that wants to help. Ben. So again, you have to look short term and long term. Let's start with short term. I've talked a lot about the surplus property, public property that the city owns. Uh, old school buildings that are no longer in use, uh, garages that are not being taken care of. Uh, those properties provide us an opportunity to generate short-term revenue in the term, uh, in the form of sales proceeds or, or lease proceeds, uh, and, and revenue in the long term uh, if we're putting these properties back on the tax rolls. So uh, we need to look real hard at those surplus properties and look at getting those back into productive use. I take a lot of pride in the role I've played uh, helping to create the Greater Syracuse Land Bank, and uh, the Land Bank has helped the city to create uh, to generate more. Uh, uh, taxes uh, from current tax collection as well as delinquent tax collection. The 500 or so properties the, the land bank has put back into productive use generate about $800,000 a year in property taxes. Uh, so those are the types of innovative solutions that I, I, I've implemented and, and would look to implement. And in the long term, we have to grow our way out of this problem. You know, over the six years I was at City Hall, we saw $1.3 billion of construction activity. We need to continue that. We need to continue to make it easier to do business in the city of Syracuse, and that's what I'll do in the long term. For those, I, I think those are relatively small. In the short term, I mean, how much, how much revenue do you think we could actually generate from these surplus properties you're talking about? Is well, significant? point well taken. And, you know, operating with a $15 million structural deficit, not enough. Uh, but it, but we have to we have to start and we have to we have to be innovative in trying to identify new solutions. Uh, as has been talked about, relationships are an important uh, part of the equation. Um, uh, state aim funding has been uh, ha has not gone up. Uh, I think we do need to try to build build those relationships. And I think if we come to the table not with not with both hands out, but but saying here's what we've done uh, to help ourselves, then we're in a better position when we're talking with our partners at the state and federal level uh, to, to hopefully get some help from them as well. All right. Um, let's, let's look at the other half of the equation, um, spending. Y each of you have talked about improving city services in some way or another, hiring more cops, um, with the exception of Howie. Um, so we've talked about revenue. Um, as far as spending goes, where specifically? Give me one place specifically where you think we can cut spending. Or if you don't think we can cut spending, tell me why not. Um, and uh, Laura. Laura, we'll start with you. One of the things I would start to look at is where we could be sharing more services. So, for example, I'm told that 
Um, the Parks Department plows their own roads, the DPW doesn't. So we know there's some redundancy in services. There's certainly redundancy in services throughout the county. The first thing I would look to do is to see where that redundancy is and to see where we can streamline those expenditures. It's what we did in schools for years. It's what school leaders do. It's what I did as a school superintendent. You learn to take a look at your departments, see if they need to be right-sized, either downsized or increased, to make sure you're spending money in a way that is truly efficacious, that's producing the desired effect. The first thing I would do is look at redundancy in services, and DPW might be a place to start. So sharing service, DPW shared <coughs> services with the county? I would be willing to look at that. When I was a school superintendent, we had four entities plowing our school district. Four. There's got to be some uh, cooperation in there and some room for cost avoidances and cost efficiencies. Um, if not by laying people off, nobody wants to do that, but I would certainly look at doing that through attrition. But there's got to be a way to reduce the redundancy in services that's okay. eating up so much of our taxpayer dollars. Okay. Juanita. Codes enforcement. Um, we have a very antiquated system. Uh, they are still working off of paper uh, and uh, in no way have a system where they're communicating uh, with other city public servants, whether it's uh, fire or police, on how they do their work. So we have a system that, in fact, could be utilized uh, in, a, in a much better way, more responsive, if it used more technology. Um, what I'd like to see is, is less uh, individuals on the street um, uh, there in their trucks and, and, and doing what they do with regard to responding uh, to incidents um, and then having to wait another day or two days or three days to figure out how we're going to respond to a particular situation. I'd like to see us use technology and I think we would actually save resources by doing that. Uh, other cities have uh, determined, especially Rochester, uh, a way to f figure out how we deal with our blight, how we deal with our squalor, how we deal with you know uh, slum lords and what have you by a, using a technical system uh, and a software where all of our other public servants are on the same page. So you save revenue by bringing in forces of teams together as opposed to using this you know archaic system uh, with paper and pen that takes weeks to get any response, whether it's to housing, whether it's to business. So, so codes are one of the places where a lot of people, I think, would say we need to spend more. Um, you know, if we want to fight blight, we need more spending for codes. So you're saying we should spend less money. We do don't we need to budget, spend more. Or? We need to be better at how we do it. So it's not uh, necessarily a cut in their budget. It's just moving around how they operate. No, it's it's using technical uh, systems, using new software uh, that would provide that service. Uh, whether or not the manpower would still be. Uh, uh, something that we would utilize, I, I, you know, I feel that just the systems itself, that, that uh, uh, through a technical software process and again, combining with teams throughout our city would be a great way to provide a better service um, and, and a better way to deal with the issues that we have. And quite frankly, I think you save money doing that. Okay. Ben? Uh, I too would look at shared services opportunities. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start with, with where I was in the city and economic development. I've been very vocal about the fact that the, that the city and the county should not have two industrial development agencies competing against each other. Uh, it results in a race to the bottom uh, where the only, uh, the only one that wins is, is whoever's uh, pitting the two municipalities against each other. Uh, so I think there's, there's overlap and duplication in economic development services between the city and the county. I think that there have been other opportunities uh, for shared services that would result in savings that have been identified through public works. You know, the, the old uh, uh, anecdote about the plows turning around at the municipal lines doing U-turns in the streets, that's not an efficient way to provide services. I think we need to look uh, at, at what ACWA was able to accomplish with the Metropolitan Water Board and look at wh how, what we could learn as it relates to the water department. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. All of them have to be done with the uh, with the best interests of the city at heart. We, uh, as mayor, it's our goal to always look out for the best interests of the city. Uh, I don't think that we need to, uh, to sell ourselves out, but I think that there's opportunities to, uh, to work better together. But I think it's important to note, we can't cut our way to prosperity. I don't think any of these savings are gonna result in, in a significant change in our trajectory. We, we need to figure out ways to invest. Okay, how are we? I'm kind of worried about what I've been hearing, both on the revenue side and the spending side. Uh, I didn't hear numbers that are realistic. We face a 15 to 20 million dollar recurring structural deficit. We have 20 to 25 million dollars in reserves left at the end of the current fiscal year. We don't have time to grow the 34 million dollar property tax levy, 50 percent to cover that deficit in a year or two. That's not going to happen. We, I don't know how much surplus property we got, but whatever it is, it's a one-shot sale. It's one-time revenue. Hotel tax is a few million dollars. So. 
We need to find a way to have a more progressive uh, tax system. And by the way, if we get the kind of reforms I'm talking about, 70 million if we just got the revenue sharing up to 1% of state revenues, the property, I mean the income tax I'm talking about at 1% on a $2.8 billion city payroll is $28 million. That also covers it. And if we can get both of those, we can cut our property taxes and have an overall more progressive, fairer system. On the spending side, you know, my question is, well, who wants to volunteer to take the cuts? Which department? Which neighborhood? We cut street repairs in half this year. We won't cut it in half again. I mean, pretty soon we just won't have streets. We want to cut cops, another fire station, another senior center, a youth program. Uh, you know, we've pretty much cut to the bone. And even the consensus, we're talking about shared services, the yeah, the Consensus Commission report said the best reason to have shared services is better uh, delivery of services and, and management of infrastructure. The savings, they didn't even show their homework, and it, it wasn't that much. Let me go back at you with this uh, question of an income tax, or, or some, some might call it a commuter tax. How, how would that not hurt the city by driving business out of the city? It doesn't come off business bottom line. I'm talking about 1%. New York City has a 3% slightly graduated income tax and New York City is booming. There are nearly 5,000 municipalities around the country that rely on the income tax and uh, a lot of them are in very conservative Republican states like Indiana and Kansas. So uh, I don't think, you know, it's not going to chase business away. Business will come here because we're providing good services, good schools, good infrastructure and uh, we need taxes to be able to provide that. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Well, you know. we don't have good schools and good infrastructure <laughs> right now, so um, that would be my counter to Howie's point. The last thing I would promote is increasing taxes. As it is, there are too few people wanting to buy a home in the city of Syracuse. Increasing taxes is not going to incentivize anybody to come live here. It's it's not the right way to do <clears> it. Juanita, I, I just you know I want I, I think we should have the conversation of you know not you know being penny wise pound foolish I, I you know I think that's what the city has been doing just cutting and cutting and cutting uh, to pay the bills we have families and kids that face the impact um, and you know uh, this idea of government efficiency is what many cities are doing you know throughout the country figuring out how you can do more with less um, and I think that's what the city needs to start with uh, there is an abundance of resources and, and assets within within city government that we need to take a step back and look at. And when I talk about codes, when I talk about our you know our different public servants, you know I'm talking about how we come together in teams and attack the same problem with 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 teams of, of uh, city officials and, and staff in our local community-based organizations to deal with the same problems and save on our resources. It's not the only answer, but it's an answer that's not just about cutting jobs. And, and, and putting people out of work. It's an answer that takes care of people. One of the things you mentioned in the primary was potentially cutting the auditor's office. Uh, is that something you'd still consider? Well, you know, I think we have to look at everything. And, and uh, you know, my sense was I was following up on what Mayor Ma Minor wanted to do early in her administration. Uh, she really put up a big fight because she felt like it was a position that, quite frankly, was offering uh, no real, you know, service to the city based on the fact that we now have to have a, an, a, an outside auditor. Do you feel that, so, that it's not offering a service to the city? I, I, again, I'm not on the inside, but my, my gut was that, you know, once we get in, we need to look and see if that's a place where we can save resources. Ben, did you have anything? Specific to, uh, to, to the auditor position? To, well, no. to, the, to, the income tax. <laughs> to the income tax or the commuter tax? Yeah, I, I, I have real concerns about it. Be, being the city's economic development director for, for six years, um, you know, it, it's, we have to compete for business. And uh, I think we bring a lot to the table. We don't have to give away the store. Uh, I certainly never did in, in my position. Um, but I think that that would uh, put us at a competitive disadvantage uh, to, uh, to su the surrounding region. All right, we're going to move on. We've got uh, a few more issues we want to cover tonight. Um, we're going to talk about poverty. Um, I think we can all agree poverty is one of the city's most critical issues. Schools need to improve. We need more jobs. We need better jobs. Housing and transportation are often inadequate. Um, we've all outlined the problem. I don't want to rehash outlining the problem because I think it's, it's been said mm -hmm. many, many times. What can a mayor do? What will you do specifically to change the direction of this? Uh, Juanita, we'll start with you. The first thing America can do is care. And uh, we need to have a leadership that from top down, we give people dignity and we care about them, whether we are police, whether we are codes. When we drive down our streets, we don't drive by the very people 
that are reaching out for help. And, and what I want to do is set that tone, that we're going to care about the very people of our city that are, that are, that are challenged. And here's a very good example. We have a deplorable water shutoff policy. We will shut off water when a landlord doesn't pay their bill, although a tenant has paid their rent, whether they're children, whether they're the disabled, whether they're seniors. That is not a good policy for those that are living in poverty. And I'd like to see us be a city that cares. That's where I start. Second, we have to focus on jobs. There's no question. We have to figure out how we start supporting local business and incentivize business to be here to actually provide jobs uh, to those that are, that are in need of them. And then being a city that supports building skill sets, uh, offering a, a trade a background, whatever it takes to match up people with jobs. We have to put people to work. I grew up in poverty. I know it takes a village, a community, to overcome adversity. And I want to do that for the city of Syracuse. And last, we have to have a better relationship with the county on our social services. We have to be connected on who needs the help and how we can supplement that help, okay. whether in our schools or in our neighborhoods. All right, thank you. Ben. Uh, just last week, I gave a very specific example of, of how uh, we can address jobs. When I knocked on doors throughout the summer, what I heard, perhaps more often than anything, was that uh, people were looking for jobs and specifically uh, parents were looking for their uh, for their kids to have job opportunities during the summer to give them something positive and productive to do and as I started talking to some of our, our local workforce development providers uh, what I found was a lot of our uh, previous youth employment programs are no longer around uh, and when I spoke with CNY Works who has who, who does have a, a robust program where they employ 475 kids every summer uh, that was the good news. The bad news was that uh, they received 2,000 applications uh, and have to uh, turn away two-thirds of, of, of the applicants. These are kids that are taking the initiative to apply for a job. So uh, I, I, I proposed a partnership with CNY Works where they would uh, request funding through the state's uh, anti-poverty initiative through the Alliance for Economic Inclusion. And I brought together about a dozen of uh, uh, my uh, friends and partners in the business community to step up and, to, and, and I didn't have to twist any arms. They were excited to say, yeah, we will happily take on uh, young people into our offices, into our businesses over the summer and give them opportunities. So okay. it's a very tangible way where I can leverage my relationships. Thanks, Ben. Howie? Well, most of our poor people are working poor and I think the fastest way to get good jobs to a lot of them is to overhaul the Equal Employment Opportunity Program, which has been on the books since 1973 to deal with city contractors, but also include city departments. Uh, the data we have from the Human Rights Commission when they reported it 2004 to 2008 showed minorities are getting one-fifth of their proportionate share of jobs on city contractors. Uh, that's inexcusable. And so we need to enforce that and make sure that those people, minorities and residents, are getting their fair share of city-funded jobs. Secondly, I've called for a Marshall Plan for the city to rebuild our high poverty neighborhoods, affordable housing, the jobs that go with that, rebuild, develop our business districts, public jobs for the unattached youth and people coming back from prison so they can get a record as an employment. And I did a news conference last week. The state spent $120 million out around the state fair. Cuomo today announced, or yesterday, $50 million for the airport. We're, we're doing trickle down instead of bottom up. And I think the investments ought to go right into the high poverty neighborhoods and when those people come up then middle class and businesses will benefit as well and I think that's the different approach that I would bring. How do you get the governor to bring that money to the city? Is it? Uh, you know I ran things? against Governor Cuomo twice and there are about a dozen issues I could list where he was on one side and now he's on my side. The millionaires tax, the ban on fracking, the living wage of fifteen dollars an hour, tuition free higher education and so forth. He responds to politics not because you're his buddy and the politics were, we got 200,000 votes. Zephyr Teachout also got 200,000 votes in the primary. And he wanted to know what we were talking about because he wanted those votes. So as an organizer, I think just to take the revenue sharing issue, I was getting calls from Republicans in the towns out in the roundup state saying, keep talking about the revenue sharing because we're hurting too. I believe a coalition that can be built and we can make Cuomo the hero. He'll save us from our fiscal crisis and we'll be able to lower our property taxes. That's the kind of organizing and political skills the next mayor's got to have. Laura. Laura. When we've inched up to a 60% graduation rate and Court of Appeals Judge Wilson affirmed in a legal decision that Syracuse City School District students have been deprived of a sound basic education, we need dramatic, bold action. My opponents have said that they will support the schools. I have no idea what that means. I don't know what that looks like or sounds like. 
we need something dramatic and I've called for mayoral responsibility and control of the school district and what it would include is with the advice and consent so as to ensure engagement and participation with the Common Council I would appoint the school board members. The reason for that is number one in Syracuse which is a dependent school district being one of the big five to run for school board it's a partisan race you have to be part of a, a political party this would take that out of it also you'd be sent there are no mercy we don't have time for in the length of time allotted for my answer but the bottom line is what it does is it sends a message to the community that the schools are of paramount importance and if we don't turn the schools around we will not turn the city around when the mayor takes responsibility for the school district she's saying the buck will stop with me i will assume the ultimate responsibility and i've said it before and i'll say it again if i don't turn it around you don't have to worry about voting for me again in four years i won't run again but we need to devise the metrics the strategic plan with the school board they are the key governing body mm -hmm for the school district. Most people can't even tell okay. you who's on our school board right now. Just So day 10 in office, somebody asks you, Laura, what are you doing to address poverty? You say, I appoint the school board now. I mean, is that? that That's the it? first key, because okay. then what you're doing is you're allowing the mayor and the common council to put people in place who can then marshal resources. You can bring community leaders together, other elected officials. You're putting the spotlight on the schools, and then what you're doing is you're supporting the school so that you will have a much more dramatic increase in the graduation rate. You'll have students graduating on time with their cohort with adequate post-secondary plans. We have students who are graduating on time with their cohorts and who have no preparation for jobs. We have manufacturing jobs in central New York that are going unfilled because our workers don't have the right skills for them. Okay. We aren't connecting the dots. The key to getting people out of poverty is to increase the graduation rate and make sure that our students have adequate post-secondary plans okay. so that they are ready to okay. earn money and jobs. Right. Um, we're going to move on because uh, we have a few more things we'd like to get to tonight. Um, changing gears again, uh, quality of life. Um, mayor's most direct impact on the average resident is in the basic delivery of services. Do my leaves get picked up? Is my street plowed? Do cops respond when I call them? So we've talked about schools, police, finances, um, but purely from a services perspective, as city residents, what drives you nuts about living in the city and what would you do to <laughs> fix it? Uh, ben, we'll start with you. The trash on the streets uh, drives me crazy. I drive around with a pair of litter tongs in my car. Uh, I, I pick them up, uh, I pick it up when I can. When I can, I go home and I, I try to uh, put something into the, the city's online uh, code enforcement um, uh, process. Um, it, uh, quality of life is, is huge. And uh, in, my, in my platform that I released last month, Syracuse Rising, I talk about proposing a quality of life commission. And, and what that is, it's a, it's a commission that includes members of um, uh, different stakeholder groups in the city, residents, business owners, department heads, uh, common counselors, school board members, and, uh, and they come together and they identify what are the specific quality of life issues in each neighborhood. Each neighborhood is different. In some, gun violence and drug activity may be the most significant issue. In others, it may be, uh, it may be nuisance crimes, car break-ins, trash on the streets. Again, personally, one of my pet peeves is just the way in which the city looks. Uh, we need to clean it up, literally. Uh, but I think quality of life is critical, and I think the Quality of Life Commission is a good first step in, in getting a handle on it citywide. Howie? I think the thing that drives me crazy is I think services are better delivered in the middle-class neighborhoods than the low-income neighborhoods. And I think the way to deal with that is to empower all the neighborhoods. I want to bring TNT back from its exile as a nonprofit, maybe to end up being defunded, into the structure of city government as neighborhood assemblies. Smaller groups, smaller organizations, around the neighborhoods that people have named and identify with and they should have real power they should have a budget from the city to do local projects that, with participatory budgeting and they should have a role in community planning and all the city departments should attend their regular meetings and people then can deal directly with the uh, problems in their community the people can solve these quality of life problems when they feel engaged and that their participation makes a difference the problem I know we have a terrible problem with voter participation and people say it doesn't matter who I vote for, it don't make any difference anyway. And we got to give people a way to be engaged where they feel they have some power and their voice counts. So I think quality of life will be solved by the people of Syracuse themselves if we give them the venue in which to do it. Right. Laura. We're not ensuring everybody's safety. People are afraid in their homes right now. 
police sergeants and other officers have told people at neighborhood watch meetings how to behave when they leave their homes, don't carry your cell phone, don't have a purse visible. We are not ensuring everybody's safety and that is our number one priority. It comes back to the police issue. Uh, people need to know that the mayor and that everybody in city government is looking out for their welfare and their safety. It comes back to the police issue. We need to have more police and we need to implement true community policing where the police have the ability and the availability to establish trusting, trusting true rapport with everybody in our city to the point where they can call our youth by name, where they're knocking on the doors of businesses and saying, I was here last night, haven't seen you in 24 hours, how are things going? People are afraid to call the police right now, and the police say to me, of course they are. There aren't enough, uh, enough of us to go around. We don't know everybody's names. That's what we should be working on. That's what, if you want to say, drives me crazy. I think it's much deeper and much more serious than that. We're not ensuring everybody's public safety. Anita. You said pet peeve and, and crime is, I, I is said serious. drive me nuts. <laughs> drive me nuts. Uh, you know what? I, I, I cannot stand it when I see our kids and our seniors walking on the street because our sidewalks aren't plowed. Uh, to me, that's deplorable. And, and we need to be a city that, that, that does that. Uh, again, I turn to Rochester, who figured it out, and where a community wanted to come forward uh, to pay a few more dollars on, on taxes to ensure that those sidewalks uh, where uh, seniors live, where they don't have access to, to, to do it themselves, where the city could come together and, and have our, our own uh, folks plowing the, the sidewalks where we know our kids are walking to school. I, I see people in wheelchairs. I see mothers in strollers on their streets trying to get the kids to school. Uh, we should not be a city, again, that doesn't care for the very people in our, uh, that, that are out there. And so for me, uh, I want to pick everyone up because I can't stand watching it. And, and even in your better neighborhoods, Howie, as you, you say, the, it, it, to see those sidewalks not plowed uh, is something that is, is everywhere. And we need to be a city that, that takes care of that. Well, that anticipates a question that one of our users submitted. Uh, many of the questions that people uh, submitted in the comments or in email were mm -hmm. topics that we've covered. Um, and one of them uh, from a user named Beastwood was, how about a sidewalk program to repair, replace, and shovel all city walks? So, Juanita, we, he we hear that from you. Ben, what about you? Yeah, again, we don't have to look uh, farther than Rochester for a model there. Um, you know, it does involve a, a, a frontage fee that, that property owners have to pay. Uh, I don't take that lightly, but the fact is our current system doesn't work. Um, relying solely on property owners uh, doesn't work. So we need to figure out a, a, an equitable way uh, to invest in our uh, pedestrian infrastructure and our sidewalks throughout the city, uh, which includes uh, repairing and replacing our sidewalks, which includes plowing our sidewalks. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in our city that don't drive cars. And if you, if you do drive a car, I think oftentimes you're, you're blind to how, uh, how, how bad it is out there. So I would encourage everyone to, 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 to take a walk around the city and, uh, or, or push somebody in a wheelchair uh, through the city and, and see, um, see how hard it is. So um, yeah, absolutely we need to do it differently. Howie. That's long been a plank in the Green Party platform for the city of Syracuse. DPW should be responsible for the sidewalks like they are for the streets. And all I can say is I'm glad to hear that we're winning that argument, and it looks <laughs> like we all agree. Uh, we'll hear, wait to hear what Laura says. Um, and and you, know, you talk about frustrating things. City Council's talking about, you know, reworking the current system where people sort of have to snitch on each other if their sidewalk's not repaired, and then they create a big expense for that one family. and. You know, a lot of people are struggling in this community. It doesn't work. And, you know, Rochester, Fairbanks, Alaska does the same thing. And we're the snowiest city in America, 10 feet a year. We think we'd figured it out by now, but maybe we got the solution now. Mm -hmm. Laura, what about it? Agreement. Again, this comes under the umbrella of public safety. We have people who just can't maintain the sidewalks. First of all, I live in an older neighborhood. There are no sidewalks. But for those who do have sidewalks, we need to find a much better way. We have families with single parents who are struggling to get out of the house in the morning, people with disabilities, people who are elderly, they can't shovel, they can't maintain the sidewalks. There has to be a better way. We need to make this a true community responsibility. Just So next mayor is going to take office in January. Your first snowfall, uh, just yes or no, do you go around and do you ticket violators who don't shovel their sidewalks? If it's the law, we have to follow the law. Yes. Yes, but I also go out there with a shovel and try to organize uh, community-based organizations, and we'll, we'll go 
um, in, in lieu of a better process? A little more than yes or no. <laughs> was this a lightning round? Did I miss it? <laughs> cool. Sorry. Yes. No, I think you have prosecutorial discretion in some things you enforce, and some things you let go. Maybe you talk to the people, but people are really burdened, and to add fines on, I mean, one of the problems. Right, we're not going to go on that. Give it in the police. <laughs> quick right, question. Just a quick follow up, because we've got to move on. Okay. Uh, Marie. Right. We're almost reaching our, our time limit here, even though there's, uh, there's no commercial pressure <laughs> to, to meet it, but uh, we'll try to keep it, keep it to an hour. Uh, now we'd like to ask each of you one specific question about your candidacy for mayor. And uh, Juanita, I'll start with you. Um, Democrats have been in charge of City Hall for 16 years, and we can all agree the city's in a bit of a pickle. Uh, why should voters elect another Democrat? Well, I'd like to offer that I, I uh, am, a, am a different Democrat. Uh, I am a Democrat that is about the people and n not marginalizing them or minimizing their voices. Uh, we need to stop being a community that thinks we have all the answers. And I think that may have been the message we heard last November. We need to be a Democratic Party that has faith in the people of the city, uh, that is out in the street listening to what they feel are the solutions and being uh, accountable for their own neighborhoods. We need to provide the resources for them. So I'm a true Democrat. I grew up in a community that was poor, but you, you, you were provided you know, opportunities to take care of yourselves and to also be able to think for yourselves. You know, th this land bank that, that uh, Ben is talking about, it's a great program. and has good intentions. But where we're missing it is we don't go out to the very neighborhoods to say, what do you want? What do you want to do with these blighted homes? Do you want a, a park? Do you want a daycare center? They have great ideas. We need to start listening to the people in our city, and that's how I would be different. And that's what they want. Okay. Right. Uh, ben, the next question is for you. Uh, the city has around 2,000 employees and an operating budget of a little less than $300 million. A lot of your experience comes in policy roles. What makes you think you're qualified to be the CEO of a city this size? It comes down to relationships. And uh, it's, it's about developing relationships with, uh, with the people that you work with. Uh, I'm very proud if, if you look at um, the, the folks that are helping me on my campaign, uh, the, the people that I'm, that I'm friends with, that I spend time with. It's a lot of people that I've worked with over the years. And it's about, uh, it's about maintaining and nurturing those relationships. It's also about surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, I, I think I have a, a, a lot of good ideas for the city, but I don't have all the answers. Um, it's, that's why it's incumbent uh, that I surround myself as mayor with, uh, with the right people uh, that, um, that have uh, experience that, that I may not. Uh, that reflect the diverse community that we that we have. Um, I, I am proud of, uh, of the teams that I've built around me. Um, I am not shy about acknowledging where where I need help. Um, but uh, I, I've I've managed people in previous positions. I've managed staffs, uh, nowhere near two two thousand people. But um, I'm confident in my ability. What I pride myself on is my ability to bring people together and to get things done. Uh, I've done it on a policy side. I've done it on a project side. Uh, and, and I look forward to doing it as mayor. All right. Uh, Howie, we'll go to you. A lot of your policies, uh, income taxes, home rule policy, uh, would need to be enacted in Albany. Uh, what makes you think you have the influence or the relationships to get those policies passed through Albany? Well, as I mentioned when I was running for governor, I was getting calls from Republicans in the suburbs and the rural areas, also getting encouragement from Democratic legislators and some city officials. All were kind of on the QT because they didn't want to get on the wrong side of Governor Cuomo. I believe there's a powerful coalition ready to be built among upstate cities, towns, and counties that are in fiscal distress and suffering from too high property taxes. And you had a letter in the Post Standard a couple years ago about how 15% of state programs are paid for by local sales and property taxes. New York is off the charts. Most other states, it's less than 1%. I mean, that coalition is ready to be built. I think it can be built. And uh, based on, you know, the experience I had running for governor in 2014, I believe that's possible. And you've got to have somebody like me who's not in either party who can get these people together and say, hey, we've got a common interest here. Let's get it done. And as I said, make it give Governor Cuomo the opportunity to be the hero. Lower our property taxes and save our cities from fiscal distress. So you'd play to the governor's ego? Uh, no, I'd play to, he's a politician. You know, he wants, he wants people to like what he's doing so he can either get reelected or even run for president. So he, let's give him a feather he can put in his cap. All right. All right. Laura, uh, this question's for you. As an educator and a former school superintendent, you've staked your campaign on this idea of mayoral control of schools. What if the state doesn't go along? What's your plan B for your time in office? 
My plan B is still to coalesce and marshal all of the available resources in, the, in our community, and I will continue to send the message. The majority of people surveyed say Syracuse is on the wrong track, and I firmly believe the way to get us back on the right track and to lead this turnaround is to get the schools to be better performing and to be safer. I will never rest with that message, and I will do whatever is necessary, even in the absence of legislation allowing mayoral responsibility. I will still pursue that. All right, we've got one final topic, and we're going to go a little over an hour, but uh, we're on uh, Facebook and the Internet, so we have no time constraints <laughs> here. Um, and we appreciate all of your time. What we want to do for this last question, um, Laura, I'm going to start with you and just pick a direction, left or right. It's not a trick. I don't understand the question. It's <laughs> just I just need you to pick a direction, left or right. Right. Okay. Uh, we are going to have each person turn to the candidate to their right and ask them one question. Um, and we will uh, start with Laura, and I'm going to give you all a minute to think about what question you would like to ask of another candidate. While you think about that, I'm going to give a brief plug for our content here. Um, just a reminder that we will have um, a spin room after this, followed by an analysis of the debate from a panel of our uh, community leaders, which will be led by our content director, John <laughs> Lammers. So now that you've had a minute to consider uh, your question, Laura, we're going to start with you and technically uh, how is to your right? Maybe not ideologically. Um, <laughs> so far not so, to so my right will, ideologically. Uh, we'll start there. And Laura, if you could ask Howie one question, uh, what would be? And Howie, you'll have a minute to answer. Okay. Howie, please explain further how you think increasing taxes will draw people to live in the city of Syracuse. I'm talking really about a tax shift from regressive sales and property taxes to progressive income taxes. The revenue sharing from the state is based on the state income tax. A local income tax would be based on the income tax, and you can graduate it. The property tax is basically highest for the bottom quintile. It's about 6%, over 6%, because they pay through their, their rent to the landlord. Uh, the people in the middle are paying in the low 4%, and the top 1% is paying 2%. And the sales tax is steeply regressive. Uh, so what that means is poor people are paying a higher proportion of their income for these taxes. If we can get these income tax reforms I'm talking about, we can lower the property tax. Maybe we get the county to lower the sales tax, and it would be fairer for everybody. We'd have a broader tax base. It would be more sustainable fiscally. So I don't want to call it a tax increase. If you're low or middle income, it would be a tax cut. If you're in the upper echelons, you might pay a little more. But I think that's the price we need to pay to have a sustainable city, good services. And uh, it'll benefit the upper income people because the poor and working class people have more money to spend and run their businesses. All right. Uh, Howie, your question to Ben. Well, one issue we've been talking about is the schools and the problem of, and also the poverty question, the problem of segregation. And I know mm -hmm. you've kind of been reinforcing my talk on we need to desegregate housing in schools. So my question is uh, specifically, how would you pursue that? So we'll start with housing. Uh, I think that uh, anytime we have uh, new rental housing going up uh, in our neighborhoods uh, that's uh, requesting public resources, we need to ensure uh, that it's mixed income. And that means in, in neighborhoods that are primarily market rate, we need to ensure affordable housing, uh, uh, require affordable housing. And in, in neighborhoods that are uh, where we have concentrated poverty, we need to, we need to uh, include some, some market rate opportunities. Uh, specific to education, you know, as much as I love the, uh, the idea of, of neighborhood schools, as we've talked about, our neighborhoods are highly segregated. And so uh, I think that we need to um, continue down the path that the, that the city is going and creating uh, schools of choice and, and different opportunities for different children, uh, building off of the progress that we've seen uh, with our CTE programs that are graduating kids at a higher level with better attendance. Uh, so it's, it's providing different opportunities for different kids uh, to, to get them, to raise them out of uh, the situations that they're in and give them opportunities to, to move forward. All right. Uh, ben, your question to Juanita. So one of the things that we've talked a lot about is the importance of, um, uh, or uh, the importance of city residency for, mm -hmm. for city employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt strongly that uh, we need to, uh, wherever possible, make sure that our city employees are, are living in the city. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that the appropriate place to, uh, to accomplish that is at the negotiating table. Right. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last night. It sounds like maybe you, you differ in your opinion. I'd like to, to talk uh, you to talk a little bit more about how, uh, how important uh, city residency is for you. Well, I don't think I differ in, in my opinion. I think uh, the, the law is the law. I mean, there's only so much that we can do. Uh, unlike you, I've sat at the table. I've been part of uh, uh, 
been with the, 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 those that are in our unions, the, the collective bargaining process. And I know that uh, when you come to the table, you have to also have a relationship where your public servants, those that are in these unions, uh, will, will provide ideas and ways that you, know, you can talk about residency because you don't always have that as your, as your option. So what I want to do is make sure that we talk about that choice. As I said last night, FIRE came to the table. They didn't have to, uh, by law, say that they would have a residency requirement, and they did. They offered the city the five-year uh, requirement, and, and that was good for them to do that. And so we have that, not because the city, it was their choice, but because FIRE uh, decided to do that. I, I want to have those types of relationships, but at the end of the day, I'm going to encourage them to be creative. I know that there are folks who say that to live in the city is a hardship. Uh, there are people who have family homes and what have you outside the city, and they want to know if the, can the city be flexible. I want to be flexible. If you uh, perhaps want to talk about a 10-year requirement, uh, and then after that, perhaps you have that option. I don't think people will leave the city. So I think we're talking about the same thing, but you can't come to the table and keep forcing something when legally you can't even start that conversation. What I want to talk about is how we have our, our public servants be a little bit more creative. Uh, I found out that many of our police officers... Sorry, we got to move on. Okay, all right. So your question for thank Laura. You. Okay, thank you. So, Laura, <laughs> um, I've been thinking about your idea of mayoral control, and you always talk about the, the educational piece of it. But it occurred to me that uh, if you actually had this system in place like they do in New York City, you would actually oversee the facilities too, uh, the Joint School Construction Board. You would be making those decisions. And right now, there's a lot of conversation about you know where we put our resources and, and where we, we back off. And this city is very tied into the Blodgett Elementary School. What are we going to do? So if you have mayoral control and you decide what's going to happen to Blodgett, what would that be? Well, as you know from our previous forums and debates, we've been asked many questions about how we will use money. Um, one that comes to mind was whether or not we'll continue to support the TNT groups. And I can't exactly remember what all of you said, but I said that I would look for TNT to become more self-supporting. I think every available dollar has to go into our schools. Westside Academy at Blodgett needs $54 million in renovations and only $17 million are available. Our students are not permitted to drink from the drinking fountains in that school. They can't go into certain spaces because the ceilings are crumbling. It's unacceptable. It's indefensible. Every dollar we have needs to go toward pr protecting our students and ensuring that they have the best facilities. We need a long-term capital project facilities plan that should be renewing every five years. There are a lot of ways to answer that, but all the money has to go into the schools and public safety. All right, candidates. Well, we've, uh, we have more questions, but we have no more time. So uh, <laughs> we're going to ask you right now to give us your uh, one-minute closing statements. Uh, think of it as your elevator pitch to the to the voter, <laughs> and uh, we'll reverse the order that we started in, and we'll start with Howie. Well, as I said, I've been telling people I want to be the next mayor of Syracuse, not its last mayor, and that's because we're in fiscal crisis, a year or two away from insolvency, a state financial control board that would decide our budget and probably cut, and maybe even decide to dissolve us into the county like the Consensus Commission uh, recommended, recommended, which reduces us to a debt district, paying for, paying for our segregated schools and paying for, paying for the pensions and health care of our former city employees. So my top, so my top priority is to find the revenue so the city can provide the services the people of this city deserve. And my overall basic approach is I want to direct resources and policies to the poor and working class people of this city. We've tried trickle down, it don't trickle down and trickle out to the neighborhoods. Poverty, high poverty census tracts have quadrupled since 2000. But if we can uplift poor working class people, uh, that will improve the crime problem and also improve the schools because where you have high concentrated poverty, you have high crime and struggling schools. And if we can do that, middle class people and businesses will want to come to the city and we can all prosper together. Ben. Thank you. The theme of my campaign is Rise Above, but it's not just a slogan, it's a call to action. So if you believe uh, in rising above partisan politics and, and moving our community forward, I encourage you to, uh, we're on Facebook, so check out my Facebook page, Ben Walsh for Mayor, and check out our website, uh, Ben Walsh for Mayor, uh, also on Instagram, Twitter, um, not on Snapchat, uh, my daughter plays around with it a little bit, but, uh, but please join us. Um, the old way of doing business isn't working, and as, uh, as an independent candidate, uh, I'm offering a new way. Uh, I've heard from throughout the city that, uh, that people want change, and I'm here to bring that change. Uh, I want to be your mayor. I want to fight for our city, 
want and I want to fight for you. Thank you. Juanita. Make no mistake, I am sitting with a Green Party candidate and two Republican candidates. This is political establishment at its best. I am the new face. I am the new Democrat that has actually lived the lives of so many of you that are just waiting for someone to hear your voice, waiting for someone to give you a jobs plan, waiting for someone to talk to you about how you can get out there and take care of your families and deal with all the issues on your street. I'm going to be the mayor that takes care of my family and your family because I know that's what you're looking for. And if you're a business person, you're also looking for a candidate that cares about the fact that in order to stay here, you have to have a partnership with the city. The city has to be there to ensure that the burden of permits and variances and all of this don't take all of your time and all of your resources. I'm going to be the mayor that has a face that smiles a face that cares, and a mayor that's going to be on your streets making sure that your voice is heard and that your families deserve and get the very input that we are trying to do so hard in the city. Thank you very much, and I look forward to being your mayor. Please vote November 7th for the Democratic candidate. Marie, you asked a question of Juanita that I wish had been asked of me. We've had 16 years of failed liberal leadership. Two of my opponents worked in City Hall, and look where we are. We went from being the 29th to the 13th most impoverished city in the country. We are ranked 100th out of 100 metropolitan areas our size by the Brookings Institute for Economic Growth. House Speaker Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local politics. And Mayor LaGuardia once said, nobody cares if you're a Republican or a Democrat when it comes to cleaning the roads. I have executive leadership. I've lived in Syracuse my entire life. I have a unique perspective and background. There's no question that we need change. People are clamoring for change. They want safer neighborhoods. They want better schools. Syracuse is on the wrong track. I will lead the turnaround. Thank you, and I ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Before we leave, Ben, did you want to respond to that comment about being a Republican? Uh, well, it's not true, uh, which is often the case with uh, what Juanita has to say. Is that ben, it's not you true. tried to get the Republican I, line. I have been. You I have, are a Republican. I have not been enrolled in a political party <laughs> for my entire 20 years since I turned 18, and to suggest otherwise is disingenuous. But not, so nobody not, knows but not what surprising. your principles and your convictions are because you're just out there saying whatever well, an opportunity Juanita, it's says. Hard, it's hard to be a mayor for everyone when all you talk about is being a Democrat. All right. No, a Democrat cares about all people, not the, not the trickle-down economic policies that you've been doing for the last eight years. You talk about a job plan. You could have created one in eight years. That was your job, and you didn't do it. And now we're supposed to believe you want to do it now. Ladies and gentlemen, you know? the real Juanita. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the real Ben, a Republican. I think we'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much, candidates, for coming. It was a terrific discussion. So I know. Um, I know. <laughs> please stay tuned for more debate coverage. We'll have uh, coverage from the spin room in a few minutes. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And from Syracuse.com and the Post Standard, thanks for watching.